Hari Bol, De Madhavru. Good to see you once Hare again. Hare Krishna. Good morning or good evening for you. <laughs> Glad to be with you again. Yeah. So it seems America is in a bit of a turmoil right now. So I was thinking of discussing on this topic of racism and bhakti hmm. and uh, taking it generically from there to the point of uh, of sectarianism and uh, bhakti basically but we'll start with racism specifically and then move forward from there so yeah, america is always in turmoil <laughs> it's just uh, it's bubbling over right now <laughs> a turmoil, always in turmoil in what sense and the political polarization is of course there but uh, what do you mean by turmoil well, the, the reality of America has always fallen short of the, um, the description, so to speak, the, the advertisement of America and the reality of America has always fallen short. Um, the American dream is often that it's just a dream, but right now that um, is coming more, more into the forefront of the conversation. Less people are wanting to pretend about that and more people are feeling to, to speak to the situation more honestly. So in that way, it's um, it's an exciting time. Oh, okay. At one level, it, that's true for every country, isn't it? Nothing lives up to the expectations that the nature of the material world. Absolutely. So, if we so I basically if thought of discussing this in broadly three parts. You know, hmm. we look at the sociological causes of something briefly. Then we look at the spiritual understanding of it. Hmm. And then we look at how that spiritual understanding can be applied. Or is there anything that our tradition can offer in such a situation? Not necessarily specifically here, but generically. Sounds great. Yeah. So, yeah at, a, at a practical level, you know, discrimination has simply been a fact of uh, history. Isn't it everywhere? And... Um, to some extent, in our modern society, there is at least a theoretical attempt toward egalitarianism. So, and there is a disdain towards inequality. In fact, one of my friends mentioned to me that a defining difference between, say, the first world and third world is, that's a different issue, but with respect to gender, gender relationship is that in the first world, at least in principle, the gender equality is accepted as a virtue. Mm. Mm. How much it is in practice, that's open to question. But in the third world, gender equality is, well, I, I wouldn't say gender discrimination, but it's more of gender diversity is emphasized in terms of different, more traditional social roles. Mm. So egalitarianism is, uh, how much of it in your experience is it a lived reality? Is, I believe you're in Detroit and Detroit is, uh, has its reputation of being, uh, to some extent, a, a high crime kind of, in at least some parts of it. Well, most parts of it. Yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, this, this issue for me is very intriguing uh, and I appreciate you inviting me to discuss it today. Um, because if, in my own personal life, it was one of the real impetuses for searching for Krishna. Um, I grew up in a low income black and Hispanic neighborhood. The schools that I went to, elementary school, middle school, high school, um, all of those, I was a minority. Um, those were between 20 to 30 percent white and then 30 to 40 percent Latino and um, African-American, both uh, black. So that seeing the disparity of those different experiences and myself growing up, I was one of the white people that lived in the kind of lower income side of town. So I saw the everyday reality of a typical black person, a typical um, Hispanic person that was going to school with me, uh, my, unlike most of my other um, you know, fellow white students. And so it really sent me into this uh, deep series of questions around why the world was the way it was. Were there structures that were creating this? Why was my experience so different from their experience? Um, although I, my parents didn't make much more money than their parents. We lived in the same neighborhoods and yet there were some clear uh, discrepancies. And so 
as I got older later on in life and, and studying and going to college and looking for an answer in the world, eventually I came to Krishna consciousness as that solution uh, for all solutions uh, in Detroit. And that's where I met the devotees, having left Highland Park, where your Guru Maharaj, Radhanath Maharaj, grew up. And Highland Park is a very well-to-do area in Chicago, um, very wealthy people. And I was doing some business there, and I was, I was just so sick of pretending that I wanted to end up like one of these people, <laughs> that I wanted to live that kind of comfortable suburban life. So I kind of ran away to Detroit to go back to where I was comfortable, the, that, that reality of the ugliness of society today in the material world. And from there, I, I just felt in my heart I'd find some solution uh, or, and, and be able to be a part of helping others there. And, and Krishna uh, came to me in that place. Prabhupada's book came to me um, in Detroit. And that was the solution I recognized um, through Prabhupada's teachings that both the people of Detroit needed and the people of Highland Park, <laughs> you know, the rich white people and the poor black people and everybody in between needs the solution that Prabhupada was offering. Um, so the, this particular issue of race really hits home for me because it's part of um, the major pulling me forward through the material energy to make it to that Krishna conscious perspective. Mm, interesting. When you say that uh, your lived reality was strikingly different, although you're in the same neighborhood, can you elaborate on that? Sure. So there was a culture around what it meant to be black and there was a culture around what it meant to be white. And so even though I was not um, privileged, uh, particularly that my parents, again, didn't make much money. We lived in the, the same neighborhood. And yet there was this expectation that I was kind of supposed to go a certain direction. And those other friends of mine were supposed to go a certain direction. So I remember being eight or nine years old. That was around the age that my, my young black friends stopped wanting to play with me outside. You know, After school, we would play sports together, run around, ride bikes, all the things that kids do. And at, at a certain age, age uh, around eight, eight or nine years old. Um, really? That was the age. Yeah, that very was the age that, so please go ahead. That's very, that's very young. Yeah, very. So at that age, the, that's when their younger or their older brothers and sisters started to kind of tease them for playing with me that, you know, you're not supposed to hang out with him. That's, that's a different world. And you're not supposed to be in that world. You're supposed to be in our world. And you know, whatever that meant. Um, and at, at a young age, I didn't understand it, of course, and I don't think they really did either. They just kind of got pressured into to feeling that way. <clears throat> and the experience of that world is, is um, generally, uh, at least especially there in, in our town and, and in most places, unfortunately, it's one where the, the family unit is very um, stratified if it exists at all. There's almost, uh, oftentimes there's fatherless homes, and the the children are being passed from one adult to another, but the adult doesn't really have a sense of responsibility towards the child. So then the child doesn't ever learn to develop trust in elders and in the world in general, because that sense of trusting the world is meant to come through that trust of parents and, and older well-wishers, family members who take care of you. So when I grew up and I got older, that's what I saw was the difference maker for me uh, we can talk about the cultural elements, the larger systemic influences in society, but I, I had a mom and a dad who who stuck by me, and the the black friends that had similar, they were the ones who I know later on went to um, you know to do well for themselves, and those that didn't have that, um, they were the ones who often got into trouble. So that that element of the family unit was a um, a large factor in my own experience. I saw. And also in the experience of my peers who were uh, in black bodies. So then this seems to be more of a difference in culture rather than a, like a systemic or governmental imposed racial discrimination. There's a difference definitely. Uh, but uh, so is this uh, something which is, so I, I've been studying this, uh, reading about this quite a bit. So it mm. seems that. Uh, the conservative commentators in America, they they often feel that it is uh, that calling this as a systemic racial discrimination is actually not addressing the issue because the issue is mm -hmm. more of difference in cultures and especially what you mentioned, absent parents. So 
so is it that uh, say generally from an indian perspective we don't uh, differentiate so much between say whites and blacks we often say the divorce rates are very high in the west and family yeah. units don't last so but even within that there is a significant disparity between the whites and the blacks isn't it in terms of longevity yeah. of marriage and uh, the integrity well of- not not so much but there's yeah so those you mentioned conservative commentators there's there's kind of two lines of thought here and the conservative comment everybody recognizes that the the black experience is a kind of a disenfranchised one at this point that it that it's difficult to be a black person in america um but how did that happen so conservative commentators will take you back to the 1950s and they'll t- take you to that and this goes to egalitarianism what you were speaking about earlier they'll take you back to the 1950s and they'll point out that at that time the black community was quite strong although they were being discriminated against by white people and they they weren't being given equal facility etc et there was there was a lot of systemic injustices but the community itself was quite strong now when the community uh in the 60s and through the civil rights movement there began to be this expectation that the government was going to take care of us the government was going to be the source action. of our they had something called affirmative action which they started the sure they're, they're, that's one of many policies you know affirmative action meaning that there should be a quota of of blacks or minorities in general that are allowed to hold positions be admitted into universities etc um so that's one of many policies that was implemented so millions and billions in in public funding etc cetera, etc cetera, were put into black communities through the government but what happened uh by the conservative narrative is that it created this kind of sense of entitlement amongst the black community and this psyche that we are victims so when in the 50s when it was clear that there you know there was this injustice it had this strengthening element for the black community that there was something to fight against and there was a reason to stick together and there was a reason to take care of each other and they were doing that quite well and so the if you look at a person like Martin Luther King and his narrative and then you take someone like Malcolm X and his narrative mm-hmm. Malcolm X was saying don't expect the white man to take care of you because he doesn't take care of anybody and so you we have to take care of ourselves and and develop black businesses develop black schools develop black communities that take care of black people but martin luther king and and his narrative obviously is the one much more famous said we we can all come together we can all live under the same roof happily and equally and i i feel the challenge there the, the evil of egalitarianism is that there's no such thing as equal in the material world mm. i was having this conversation with um with a black friend the other day who's a devotee disciple of bhakti tirtha maharaj and he was pointing out that this idea of equality we see it nowhere else in nature he says if and his grandpa taught him this with a tomato plant he said my grandpa grow, loves to grow tomato plants and he takes care of all the same soil all the same water all the same sun but some tomato plants will yield very big lush tomatoes and some tomato plants will yield very small sickly looking tomatoes right same tomato plant same soil same sun but very different outcome and that's a microcosm of the macrocosm that in the material energy you're always going to have disparity so then this idea that somehow you deserve equality it's running against the grain of god's creation it's running against the grain of what's actually true so you're not dealing with reality anymore and then you develop this very kind of like fantasy consciousness this this dream like uh, idea of how things should be which then don't allow you to act in a wholesome way with how things actually are and so that's kind of the Malcolm X uh perumpura you could say of black leaders who in America they don't get much attention. You don't hear the the quotes of of Malcolm X, you hear the quotes of Martin Luther King. But the quotes of Martin Luther King speak to this spiritual idea happening on the material level without any spiritual culture. And so that that dream has it's kind of become a nightmare now. Um this entitlement towards equality without any of the ethics of responsibility. so uh, this is a good point about tomato you know i never thought of that example but it's true i think the american declaration of rights said that we consider equality liberty and the search for happiness as self evident truths but you That's know equality right. equality is not a self evident truth 
it's it's more of a metaphysical aspiration we could say yes. or it's more like a heart's aspiration absolutely what is a self evident truth is an is an equality mm, and uh, so martin luther king when he wanted equality or he sought that was he also a proponent of uh, supporter of uh, affirmative action and things like that or he was more that people should work and uh, uh, come to a level of equality yeah see that's i without dismissing you know his his good work his good intentions martin luther king didn't have so much policy he didn't have so much of the practical um he he was just speaking to the larger idea of the importance uh, the the value of black people as equal to white people which again in in a spiritual uh perspective we can agree with but then on, on the relative realities of the the material world never has there been a time when communities have been able to interface in that way that's that's never throughout history always has there been this disparity of of difference race nationalism some reason to try to divide and conquer that's the material world so mlk he's he's a, a pastor a minister and martin luther or uh, malcolm x is also a, a a minister in the muslim church the um nation of islam and but malcolm x recognized you can't expect a spiritual experience when you're only offering material solutions so but but even on the material side mlk didn't have so much policy that he advocated he just spoke to this grand idea of of whites and blacks and all other nations coming to you you know i have a dream uh speech is is the famous characterization of that yeah. and so um but it it is just that it's just a dream unless you're giving people spiritual knowledge you can't expect material uh, arrangements to create a spiritual experience mm. oh, speaking from an indian perspective this is this whole problem in india there has been caste discrimination and yeah, right. of course i would say that the casteism has been a huge evil and simultaneously it said that the portrayal of the evil has often been far greater than the actual evil mm. uh, especially the way it has been portrayed almost in, by many people in the west many western commentators it's uh, hinduism is considered to be like unforgivably wrong because of it being casteist that's right so now the because of the policy of reservations and quotas it's caste consciousness rather being rather than being removed has become even more deeply ingrained into the politics of the country mm. so different countries were different parts of the country you can get elected only if you're belonging to a particular caste and if you pander to a particular group and to some extent urban that's that's not a law that's just the social dynamic right social dynamics of course yeah. now by law also uh, for example in government jobs and in universities certain quotas certain a uh, significant number of quotas have been reserved for certain people so mm. for example now it's in many places many universities 50% quota is reserved so 50% mm. will be based on your reservations and different there are scheduled castes there are scheduled tribes there are other backward classes it's a whole genre and there are uh, there are cases of say parents in villages when the child is born they deliberately give a different name to the child so that he seems to be born uh, say uh, other backward caste so that he will get some privileges or some facilities uh -huh. not privileges some facilities so yeah. now now the government at least the court has tried to put a cap on 50% but there are attempts to subvert that and go it be taken beyond 50% also the reservations so yeah. now if there is caste consciousness lesser in the cities now i never lived in a village i lived in not metropolitan cities in my childhood but in say in reasonable small towns or cities <coughs> and um i was born in a brahmin family so i can't talk about the experience of a somebody from a lower caste but still i have never encountered overt casteist discrimination in the cities and the reason for that is quite often it's not necessarily like a spiritual 
education was there or a uh, lot of talk about egalitarianism was there but it is more of a uh, the socio economic structures of urbanization uh, often mm-hmm. disrupt uh, other socio socio cultural socio economic arrangements so often it's yeah. a, it's more of a meritocracy and yeah. um, city so if you especially in the private sector if you work well you get a job you get promoted you succeed so if we can have i often talk about equality at four levels so there is mm. equality of identity equality of ability equality of opportunity and equality of results so equality of identity is something which is a metaphysical fact mm? but mm. it is not a practical reality then equality of ability is simply a lie it's not true Now, no metric that you take on which people are equal. You take IQ, you take physical ability, you take musical ability, whatever. Right. So then, now what we can provide is equally equality of opportunity. And beyond right. that is equality of results. If we try to mandate equality of results, that backfires, because then people who are having a special ability, they don't get the opportunity to channel their abilities. and people who don't have abilities they also they also think that hey, i'm going to get a good result because the results are already fixed that's right so basically now in india mm, there is almost like a reverse discrimination now of course casteism is still very much a reality in the villages and mm. um, but uh, in in the educational sphere or the government employment sphere there is almost like a reverse discrimination against the against the upper castes and especially the brahmins and there has been a large scale immigration of the upper castes uh, to the west mm. in fact you've seen america lot of south indians you will find those yes. who are in software and lot of maybe gujaratis who are in the hotel business mm-hmm. but now uh, now there are various reasons and we don't want to go into that point uh, the socio politics of that too much but the point i was making is that trying to use socio socio economic or socio political measures socio political measures to try to bring about equality it almost always backfires mm. it doesn't necessarily lead to um, healthy results very rarely my own considerations here is that it's and to your point this this attempt to create um social uh, kind of like a legalistic approach to this mandating um the abolishment of racism so to speak it's it's kind of like telling somebody to not have cancer it's it's not that easy uh it it's it's so ingrained in the psyche of a conditioned person in fact that's what it means to be conditioned is to make these designations for the purpose of protecting your ability to gratify your senses and so the party spirit is a part of the material world party and until somebody comes to a, a platform of elevated krishna consciousness it's going to remain that tendency to flock you know birds of a feather flocking together yeah now this is let's not get too much into the scon dynamics because it's a little difficult yeah. because my experience is different your experience is different and uh let's focus more on the principles so with respect to um the current uh, so the so in general how much do you see the compatibility of uh, bhakti with social justice as it is as it is uh, quite aggressively advocated by some people today yeah um there's a purport uh, chapter 12 text 11 of the bhagavad gita shri the prabhupad gives and he describes that so service to your country service to your family service to your society may be accepted so that in the ultimate you recognize the value of serving krishna And so when i meet people of the of the social justice ilk and i think about your own gurmaraj and and so many devotees of the early days they were coming from this social justice background they were out there 
uh, trying to make the world a better place through socioeconomic adjustment. And they saw the futility of that in the ultimate sense and then through that recognized the value of bhakti. And so that activist spirit, Prabhupada took hold of that. He, he bridled that, he harnessed that and said, okay, now go be an activist for Krishna. Go be a Sankirtan activist. Go be a book distributor. Go be a Harinam uh, devotee. Start a center where you culture people out to do the same. <coughs> so on that side, we can see it's very compatible in principle somebody sees the world could be a better place and they want to give themselves to that cause. The modern expression of social justice and especially today's conversation, it's a dangerous one. And I, again, I mentioned that devotee um, black who, who grew up in uh, the society, a, a disciple of Bhakti Tirta Maharaj. He was pointing out to me a few days ago that the very slippery slope of the modern social justice movement, especially which is mostly the conversation is centered around a sense of entitlement, that we deserve certain things and we're not getting these certain things and you have to give them to us. So in that way, it's a, it's a very atheistic premise, this idea that God is ultimately that, that goes back to Krishna himself, that Krishna is not giving me the world that I deserve. And the, the introspective person, the spiritualist is always thinking that God is providing the perfect atmosphere for my, my spiritual development. So. It's a, it's a tricky, um, it's a, a, a slippery slope, a double-edged sword, you could say, that the conversation about entitlement and what I deserve is the main focus of the social justice movement today. And there's very little discussion of responsibility. What's the sacrifice? What's my contribution that I should be giving to society? There's very little understanding of that amongst people in general. And so without that conversation, that's the real conversation of bhakti. Be thou happy by this sacrifice the Sankirtan Yagya. So it, it's, it's about putting in the work, ultimately, spiritual life. It's not something that's just going to come down with the wave of a magic wand. You have to put in the effort. And so this, this mood of entitlement that you see pervasive in the social justice culture potentially erodes that otherwise favorable recognition of the importance of service, the importance of the kind of spiritual sovereignty of all living entities. Mm. Yeah, it's well put. I also, you know, at one level, the principle of social justice, the underlying uh, I premise that, uh, that those who are disadvantaged or deprived in life should be helped. That's, that appeals to the compassion, the compassion within, uh, within any, any decent person's heart. No, and that's right. That as as devotees, also we are expected to be compassionate. So mm. I feel we could empathize with the with the underlying ideals of social justice. Mm. At the same time, the practices it is more of a you use the word entitlement. I have heard the word used victimhood. The idea of that's the right. the idea of the virtuous victim. Yes. That, uh, that if you are victimized, then that itself makes you virtuous. That mm. it is, but it could be so many other factors because of which somebody is in a difficult situation. And um, it's interesting you connected that with atheism. That so the world is not as it is meant to be. Yeah. And therefore, we have to make it the make it. We have to remake the world. That's right. That's interesting. Now, again, to some extent, material improvement and material emancipation. Say, for example, charity is an important principle in the Yagya Dana Tapa. So, Dana is an important mm. principle there in our Vedic tradition yep. also. So, it's not that uh, we reject the idea of improving the world, but. Uh, <clears throat> But, but the world's like, idea of what is an improvement, right? Versus yeah, so, Krishna's no, no, idea of what is improvement. About improving even at the material level, in terms yeah. of helping people at a material level. But um, to some extent, the philosophy of karma within our tradition mm. uh, removes that sense of, uh, say, entitlement or a virtuous victimhood. And yes, we are where we are and we need to move forward from there. There's this interesting point. I was talking with one African-American devotee and he, he was also against this idea. 
uh, a black devotee. So he said that many people have this, many blacks have this idea that, oh, you know, we were kings and queens in Africa and the, the whites came and enslaved us. Hmm. The actual reality is that many of the people who were, who were taken as slaves from Africa were slaves already in Africa. And they were enslaved they were by blacks. Sold by Africans. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So they were. So to a large extent, throughout human history, uh, there has been discrimination. There has been slavery. There has been. Uh, there has been distress. So. I think the foundation which uh, the Bhagavad Gita offers, that this world is a place of distress. Then, rather than constantly resenting that why why is there so much distress in my life we begin with the premise that yes there is distress and Prabhupada writes in that purport uh, 933 that anitya masukham lokam imam prapte bhajaswamam so there he states that uh, while there are, dis, dis, there are disparities in this world like rich and poor or um, attractive and unattractive but mm. The fact is that the world is not a happy place for anyone. So, <laughs> <laughs> so right. in that sense, uh, if we ha have these two spiritual principles, one is acknowledge that the world is a tough place for everyone and right. don't, uh, don't obsess over the injustices that we perceive that have come upon us. And second is, yes, at a human level, we try to help each other. So the charity and compassion, when they are, when they are individual virtues to be cultivated, hmm. then it often leads to the development of the human consciousness. It leads to a greater bonding between people. It also leads to a sense of responsibility, both for the receiver and the giver. Hmm? Hmm. But when that those are tried to be implemented as socio-economic policies or socio-political policies, then that creates a sense of entitlement. And though yes. even those the people become less, you know, I'm already paying so much taxes to the government for all the social policies. Why should I give some more charity after that? And so to some extent, uh, there, the Bhagavad Gita also talks a lot about for, it's a call for Arjuna to take up responsibility. Yes. So now, so do you have anything to say on this before I move to another point? Then, any thoughts on this? What I spoke till now? I, I think you're we're echoing each other there. Um, okay. And so now people might okay go ahead go ahead. Okay. Now some people might say that we are actually say for example now the agitation that is happening the the protests and some of them are generating into riots. So mm -hmm. They're saying we are actually taking responsibility. You know, we are taking responsibility to agitate, to bring about a change. So in what way exactly is the, uh, the agitation for social justice uh, involving a rejection of responsibility? Because at one level, from a distant perspective, it is impressive that one, one atrocious action has sparked a, a nationwide agitation. In fact, if you see throughout history, uh, there, are, there are horrible atrocities that have happened. And isn't it also a sign of people taking responsibility that this is wrong and this shouldn't happen? Hopefully. And, and that's where I think Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, he has this wonderful quote that the world is in no need of a reformer. He who thinks the world is in need of reform is in need of reform himself. Yes. And so that, that sense of what is wrong has to start with myself first. We, we hear people saying, I, I hear even in the devotee community, to say that you're not racist, to say that you don't have these prejudices, it's to some degree saying that you're a pure devotee. And who's ready to do that? Because so long as we're in this material energy connected to the three gunas, we're going to have these prejudices. Now, buddhi yoga dananjaya, can we act with intelligence? Yes. But will the feelings and emotions of prejudice still be there? 
until we're pure. <laughs> so if, if out of a, a kind of attempt to pretend that they are uh, not responsible and not culpable and not um, themselves prejudiced, afflicted by these same things, all this anger and vehement opposition towards the government and other such infrastructures which apparently support racism, if a person is engaging in those protests just to avoid the ugliness in their own heart, then it's a problem. But if they're doing it as a, an act of repentance, seeing that I'm a part of the problem, I have these same tendencies in my heart, and I want to create a social structure which to as, as a healthy a degree as possible asks me and allows me to be the better version of myself, the intelligent buddhi yoga, the, the intelligent version of myself, then that's a healthy, wholesome way to engage. But when there's this idea that, um, you know, not to speak about ISKCON too much, but this, this psyche comes into religious practitioners, the church will be God conscious for me. The temple will be God conscious for me. The government will be socially conscious for me. They need to do the work, not me. Then that's a problem. But when the work is to create a system by which we're all supported and better facilitated in taking personal responsibility, I think in there is the, the wholesome harmony uh, of that social justice activity. Hmm. So this is, uh, basically you cannot outsource responsibility. That is, now, with respect to the protests that are happening, at one level, acknowledging that something is wrong, it's two things. When there is injustice, to feel anger or outrage on encountering injustice indicates that our conscience is still alive and active. So anger often tells us that something is wrong. But anger yes. doesn't always tell us what exactly is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so often the, the energy from outrage doesn't always go in the constructive directions. Mm. Mm. That's why we see the protests have degenerated into riots at quite a few places. Mm. Mm. And uh, you know, Across now, Prabhupada often, I think, is a quote attributed to Prabhupada, or Prabhupada himself said it that there have been so many resolutions, dissolutions, revolutions, but no, no solution. solution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, at one level, is there, do you know any revolution that has actually led to a positive change? The French Revolution led to the, what do they call it, the decade of terror or something like that. After that, <laughs> Uh, it was quite brutal violence. The Russian Revolution led to uh, what is called 100 million corpses. Because after the Bolsheviks and everything came up, Stalin, Lenin. Uh, yeah. Is there any country where after a violent revolution, things really became better? Significantly? Yeah. That's, well, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tricky question because... Uh, for, speaking from a Krishna conscious place, the um, and I was having this discussion with a few friends a few days ago. You see, in in communism, for example, and the, the the attempt to revolutionize things, get, bring the power back to the people, so to speak. When you bring power to the people, there's no one to take responsibility for the power. There's no name to the power, and in that vacuum of responsibility, then unscrupulous people come in and take advantage of the situation. And they, they take the power that's just lying there for anyone to grab. But, but then they're able to still speak to this kind of egalitarian, we the people have the power, when in actuality they're the one wielding it. And so Stalin is, is a classic example of this. So this is the danger of these impersonal revolutions based on principles with nobody to actually represent and, and em, em, um, be emblematic of those ideas. So where has there been healthy revolution? It's always been led by a person who has then taken responsibility. That this is our revolution and we're taking, uh, I, I'm going to take care to lead these principles forward. Yeah. Maybe in South Africa, from what I have read, now again, 
we don't want to get into politics too much but yeah, it does I'm trying to stay out of that also <laughs> sorry I, I said I'm trying to stay away from specifics also I'm just yeah, okay. trying to speak to that principle <laughs> yeah that's true so let's uh, do that but uh, at one level in kurukshetra krishna did fight a war and uh, it was uh, a war to overthrow unscrupulous people who had grabbed power that's right and uh, krishna himself wanted that war and it's in, and after that there was a golden period when yudhishthira was ruling although it was not phenomenally long but it was there so mm. so in principle it's more a matter of you know, whether reform will work whether reformation will work or revolution will work it's not so much the particular process but it's more the matter of consciousness so if the consciousness of the individuals is somewhat elevated or spiritualized then in some situations a reformation might work and some situations a revolution might be required but yes. more important is the as prabhupad writes in the, i think the bhagavatam par put revolution of consciousness there is yes. there is what is required yeah, we can look at the many wars that america has fought in the name of democracy and when they take out despotic leaders such as saddam hussein in iraq now people might say well he was not a very good leader and he treated his people very poorly but ask any iraqi what their life has been like over the last 20 years since he's been removed and and it's been hell on earth it's been so difficult for them the last 20 years so there's a saying the blind uncle is better than no uncle you remove the bad guy but now there's no guy and so all the petty little bad guys fight amongst themselves and there's nobody to keep them in check anymore so it's it's a very um it's a very tricky in the ideal of freedom and democracy what winds up taking place if there's not a responsible leader is uh, just more despotism mm. so in a sense there is equal there there are inequalities in the world and for a third party to intervene to try to set right the inequalities that often backfires yes so of course to some extent there has to be the rule of law and there has to be some level of limits but um, at each situation ultimately people have to negotiate among themselves and move forward mm -hmm. that's interesting one thing we can we can see that um in russia just to give a, a practical example of a, a healthy revolution when the iron curtain finally fell now practically speaking most of russia is still run like a communist country but there's a few freedoms which are allowed now which are still um which weren't there in the 70s and 80s and and that those opportunities have come to our own devotees that there's a an openness in practicing your spirituality now that wasn't there 30 years ago that has facilitated you know that the burgeoning movement in russia uh and which is blowing up in ways that it's not doing in any other parts of the world so we can see that as as on the net positive although practically speaking the way putin runs his country and the way that it was run 30 years prior is not very different <laughs> but at least there's there's some um legal protections now for doing things like practicing krishna consciousness yeah and i believe the church is also spreading quite fast over there christianity is also spreading quite quite active mm. there was a hunger for religion and that was suppressed and now it is bursting forth yes so then that also reads to the idea of uh, human rights at one level it seems very appealing but mm -hmm. for somebody to try to police the administration of human rights everywhere yeah that can become counterproductive and what's really unfortunate you you're speaking to it so well earlier with your distinction of the four equalities because the value of human life is not understood then what it means to be virtuous or just towards human life can't be understood either because the value of human life is to get rich become powerful within the material energy to have influence over others that's what people 
think the value of human life is. So that naturally, how can you have equality for everyone trying to be unequal? That's the irony. Come be equal so you can endeavor to be unequal yet again, right? To prove your wealth, to prove your power, to prove your beauty, to prove your fame above everybody else. So you should get equal opportunity to be better than everyone else. It's a contradiction in values. Whereas in the spiritual culture, everybody is is actually able to have equal opportunity to connect to Krishna. And Krishna doesn't care whether you're a Shudra or a Brahmana or a wealthy king. As long as you're offering your efforts in sacrifice to him, you're going to be able to come closer. So I remember growing up, as I mentioned, in that um, low-income uh, minority area, and Michael Jordan, that was when he was at the peak of his fame. He was the most famous person on the planet. He won like six national championships playing basketball. And so every classroom in my elementary and middle school had a poster that said, be like Mike, be like Michael Jordan. And so especially all the black kids were looking at that poster and thinking, yeah, I'm going to be like Michael Jordan. But the reality is that none of them were going to be like Michael Jordan. It was an impossibility from the beginning. And so to plant this idea that you can become anything you want actually disenfranchises the person from being who they should be, from working on a, on a, a local responsible level, developing the relationships they have in a wholesome way to create a God conscious life. This is a profound point, and it speaks back to the earlier point, which Prabhupada said, the world is not a happy place for anyone. So exactly. rather than trying to, rather than trying to, you know, presume that we can achieve a particular dream trajectory. So rather than starting with a dream, and presuming that I have a right to get there, it might be better to start with where we are and then see what, where, where I can go from here. Yes. So of course we all need to some extent as human beings, we, we want hope. We want what makes us wake up and work every day is the hope that um, tomorrow can be better than today and that I can play a part in making tomorrow better than today. Yes. But, but otherwise, but while doing that, how we go about doing it, that is important. So it's, if I start with the aim of a utopia, and then I only set myself up for frustration. That's right. It's a fool's paradise. Hmm. Michael Jordan's position is wanted because nobody else has it. <laughs> if everyone was Michael Jordan, there'd be nothing special about it. So it's this contradiction in terms that the success is inequality, success is defined by inequality, and yet everyone should have equal opportunity to attain that success. How can you have happiness? <laughs> hmm. So there is, to some extent, a unidimensional definition of success, which is a problem over here. And we need a more multifaceted definition of success that there are different things can be success for different people and at one level it's it's curious that people in a in a liberal democracy or, or basically in a liberal culture they say that i want the right to choose my way of living my definition of success and yet most people end up essentially having the same definition of success that's right with a very stereotyped idea of what life is about yeah. And somebody that doesn't ascribe to that idea of what life is about, they, they denigrate and dismiss as archaic or uh, and any number of other pejoratives. <laughs> yeah. So, so we could say that what we can contribute to, what our wisdom can contribute to it, is that... <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm trying to summarize now. And yeah, yeah, you want to say something? Well, we our our tradition has values which are beyond just the comforts of the material energy, which are anyway not that comfortable. <laughs> so we have a way for the the everyday worker to value himself again. I I loved what you pointed out earlier that, that it's actually the natural economics of society that creates some some level of healthy egalitarianism. 
And when I think about our, our acharyas wanting us to practice Varnashram, what's the value of Varnashram is that it, it puts me in a circumstance where I become dependent on you. Although you may be a shudra, for example, I'm dependent on you for certain services and abilities that I, I just won't have unless you give them to me. Whereas in today's modern society, I only need an Amazon Prime account and no one else matters in my life as long as the Amazon delivery guy can bring me the stuff that I click a button to, to acquire. I can eat, I can sleep, I can mate, I can defend without having any connection of responsibility to any other person. But when you're living in a more um, integrated society and witnessing the work of others, that guy might be the mechanic for your car and you might be driving a $100,000 car, but you're dependent on that mechanic to keep it running for you. And so it, there's a, a degree of respect and appreciation for that mechanic doing that wholesome work that creates some level of healthy, you could say, egalitarianism. Yes. You know this. So personal bonding that is so yeah. important as a, as you could say, as an organic fabric for society or organic foundation for society that is often eroded when there yes. is, uh, when there is social when there is too, where is excessive socio-political or socio-economic intervention. That's right. Uh, I've read about this quite a bit. Let's say, I think in America after the Second World War, when the veterans came back, you know, many of them were injured and other things. So the government decided to take responsibility for them. And the intergenerational bonds, like say children take care of the parents, mm. those intergenerational bonds started getting broken. Yes. And then after that, say in the past, if a man and woman woman got together and if the woman became pregnant, then the man had to take responsibility. Yes. But then when abortion was legalized, then basically the man can get away with whatever they want. And when single mother still happened, then if the government is going to support single motherhood, then the man has no impetus to take responsibility. Right. So then basically... And in some cases, as, as they, they point out in the black community, the conservative commentators, they'll say that the, the woman is incentivized to have a child out of wedlock or to not involve the father because she's going to get money from the government anyway. So even if, even if the father would want to be involved and be there in the child's life, the, the woman sees an opportunity to get a paycheck for doing essentially you know, nothing, just having the child and not aborting the fetus. And what condition the child's kept in beyond that is, is, you know, at a bare minimum in terms of what the government's willing to continue to pay her to be a mom. So then she's incentivized to not involve the father and to, to give that child a home without a dad. Yeah. In some ways, the community services, say, for example, if a child is orphan or child is abused, or something like that. The community services are child care community services are much more proactive in America, but it seems that uh, in India, again, I don't want to generalize or universalize, but there is an ethos for taking responsibility. Mm. That the idea that you know, in general, say if a parent somehow a parents pass away or something like that, and somebody in the extended family will take care. So it yes. is. So there are those those more personal human bonds are often eroded when yeah, obstructed. Yeah. So I think uh, when I had come to your place, I spoke on Frederick Nietzsche. So he said that when God is rejected from society, society will go in two directions, either individualism or totalitarianism. Yeah. Right. And so, and uh, so, to some extent, um, individualism is I alone matter. And then what happens is the state becomes totalitarian. So basically, state starts playing the role of God. That's right. So they, they meet back together at the end. <laughs> that hyper individualism yeah. creates totalitarianism. Yeah, and the state, state can't really take the role of God. No. So, so where do we, to some extent, there are natural, natural, you could say, 
pillars of society so for example family is one of the foundational pillars and more mm. than specifically family it's more interpersonal bonds and those interpersonal bonds if they are not there anything that erodes those bonds that is going to eventually lead to erosion of society so to the so if the effort for social justice actually brings people together at a personal level one challenge of social justice one challenge with respect to social justice often is that it leads to identity politics where the individual mm. doesn't matter the group alone matters mm. and then that again leads to the denudation of individual responsibility but uh, our spiritual understanding asserts individuality asserts individual responsibility and fosters the spiritual consciousness or the evolved consciousness that will take uh, that will lead to interpersonal bonding although we might say that at a, if we become spiritually advanced we may become a too otherworldly but actually to to some extent the more spiritually advanced we are the more we are able to take up responsibility and honor commitments otherwise it becomes very difficult to sustain them and yeah absolutely absolutely so the there's a quote of prabhupada when he says that there is no use of crying for world peace unless there is the awakening of divine consciousness in the individual absolutely and i think that's what is essentially required so sometimes socio economic measures or socio political measures can help but ultimately it boils down to individuals have to take up responsibilities and that's the vedic culture of societies organization is monarchical and the monarch is meant to be the emblem of responsible behavior that's what characterizes a good monarch is someone who's supremely responsible and that sense of responsibility and duty trickles down into the rest of society that all the people's follow the lead of that leader we have our experience of leaders today just taking advantage of their position and exploiting those underneath them but the monarchs uh, and we see even it's not so long ago that there were such monarchs with that ethic on the planet that saw their their duty their their sovereign sacred responsibility to care for those underneath them and so then that trickles down and each parent wants to care for the child and the child wants to to care for someone and something and that's the culture of the society um characterized by that monarch yeah so often we have the idea of the king as having power and privilege but there is a there is a sense of responsibility traditionally also you know, that if that's somebody right. somebody is the head of any particular unit then how responsibly they actually acted or not that's 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 depends on situation but at least in principle it was understood that you have to take responsibility yes you got to serve someone <laughs> yeah that's there's true. an american folk singer bob dylan he has a song you have to serve someone <laughs> oh okay. is it you may serve the devil or you may serve the lord but you have to serve someone <laughs> so this the, that's the evil of the modern social movements is they potentially there's those who have this idea i should be served rather than i if if they're trying to create an atmosphere in the government by which they can serve in a wholesome way and you can rec- there's public defenders in america um people who are um the government lawyers basically so people who can't afford legal representation there's many public defenders who are part of these protests and i can appreciate that they're on the ground level seeing the systemic racism seeing the the way that the system is against blacks you know because they're every day fighting against it themselves so i can see that they're there advocating for just a fair playing field right because they're doing day in and day out work but there's many other people who are just there because they feel entitled to have an experience that they've done no work to deserve and so this is the um the thin line that we we must walk when having this conversation as bhaktas who ultimately recognize it's about our own effort it's about our own yagya our own sacrifice and that's what will bring the reward internally even if externally nothing happens internally krishna will see to it that we're rewarded in the ultimate sense mm. 
So sometimes our efforts will, at an external level, provide a, produce a result of bringing about some social change, or even an individual change. Mm. Say, even a person, some people by their efforts might be able to create a better future for themselves in this world. Sometimes we will not be able to. But rather than blaming society for that, we understand if we take responsibility, at least we will. Our spirituality will grow. It will be nourished. And that's right. That's where the lasting satisfaction exists. Yes. Um, so, so I'll try to summarize. I mean, we went a lot or a lot of territory. <laughs> not sure whether we can, but I'm, uh, glad you, I'm glad you're taking that task and not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. So basically, I think we plan to discuss racism and bhakti, but our topic became racism, social justice, and bhakti to some extent. So mm -hmm. it started by with your experience of that there was definitely difference between the races, but it was not so much. It was more of a cultural difference rather than a like a externally imposed discrimination systemically, and. Uh, then I talked about what in India is there. Also that sometimes the affirmative action, sometimes let's say India, there's reservation systems or there in the West, there is affirmative action. So that leads to a sense of entitlement. And then that leads to uh, further wrongs. Say, for example, India, mass immigration of meritorious people. So we I mentioned about these four levels of equality. That equality of identity it is you mentioned that it's a it's a it's not a material fact and to try to get to experience a spiritual reality at the material level through some material arrangements is not going to work mm -hmm. so it is interesting you mentioned about malcolm x's idea that stop expecting things from the west from the from the whites and uh, martin luther king's aspiration that we will all be united together so equality, so equality at the level of identity, we accept it as a spiritual reality, but that can be realized only by spiritual growth, not by, at a material level, equality is not self-evident. It's inequality that's self-evident. And that you talk about second level, equality of ability, which is, which is a lie. But everybody has some ability. And if different people can be engaged according to their ability, then, then we need different definitions of success for different people. But yes. when society has one definition of success, then it creates a utopia. Say, for example, you know, maybe one in a bill, one in a million, or one in some will become like Michael Jordan. But if everybody starts dreaming like that, they just set themselves up for frustration. Yes. So then, society needs to create equality of opportunity. Uh, but then, what is the equality of opportunity for? So that we can have extraordinary results. And in that sense, the equality of opportunity will not lead to equality of results. Mm. So, and actually what makes, uh, what makes people attractive is their individual talents. So what makes Michael Jordan special or say in India, Sachin Tendulkar special is just because he was so talented. Yes. So if, if um, everybody was made equal artificially in terms of results, then all speciality and the spice of, human life and culture and society, all of it would be lost. Yes. So then, so within the, so when there is a sense of entitlement created that I talked about, I mentioned this point that the, our tradition starts with the premise that the world is a distressful place and life is tough. So rather than obsessing over the disparities that, oh, why is this person wealthy and I poor? We start with the premise, yes, life is tough for everyone. And then make the best of it. Yes, so, yourself. <laughs> so then you talk about, uh, rather than expecting that the world should serve me, or that because I am, I am, I am in distress or I am deprived, so therefore I am entitled to something, rather I take responsibility to do what I can. So then we all can, to some extent, if we take responsibility, create a better life. And even if we don't, sometimes our efforts will lead to a better life for us. Sometimes it will lead to a better life for society. But even if we don't, if we are spiritually connected, then we grow spiritually and that's where we find happiness. And mm -hmm. then as far as 
social reform efforts, social change efforts are concerned. So just as you talked about, you know, whether it's reformation or revolution, unless there is an elevated consciousness where somebody is taking responsibility, those will, those will either collapse or even backfire. It will just lead to a different kind of despotism or different mm. kind of distress. Mm. And uh, often when there is inequality in the world, like you talked about the Middle East and America intervening over there, that there are disparities, but if a third person tries to artificially intervene, then often that leads to worsening of those disparities in a different form. Mm. So one of the big advantages of encouraging people to take responsibility is that it not only leads people to grow, but it also leads to interpersonal bonding. So parents take responsibility for children or different members of society take, remember, take, take responsibility for each other. Yes. And so at one level, when people are campaigning for social just for social justice, they are, it seems that they're taking responsibility, but it's, it's quite amorphous. Like anger tells us that something is wrong, but anger doesn't tell us exactly what is wrong. Is and that's why protests can quickly degenerate into riots because anger is often blind. So the, the best thing that we from our tradition can offer is that you know, folk take responsibility to raise, raise your consciousness. Like Prabhupada said that there is, no, there is no use of crying for world peace unless there is awakening of divine consciousness in the individual. And we can, at our level, provide resources for ourselves and for others to raise their consciousness. And of course, you mentioned toward the conclusion that there, there are some people who within the social justice areas are also sincerely working because they, they see the racism, the discrimination, and they're working to uh, fix it in a, in a genuine way. And there are things they need fixing, but there are others and many others who might be they're simply because of entitlement. So mm. rather than taking strong positions on, on issues, such issues, we can focus more on the importance of taking uh, individual responsibility to cultivate our spirituality. Okay. Any other things? Felt that any? Wonderful, wonderful summary. Uh, and it's always so exciting to speak with you because these good things come out of me when I'm around a good good person. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's wonderful to have your association again. I'm a little close to time for another call. So um, Definitely talking with you, bro. yeah, it's, it's been wonderful. Thank you for uh, fleshing these things out. I hope we can do this again soon. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Bo.